right? The 10,000 hours is something that's it's a nice round number. It's very sexy. Gladwell thinks that he sees a similar kind of pattern with Bill Gates and Sun Microsystems co-founder Bill Joy and the Beatles and other people. Um, it's actually not just the 10,000 hours that turns out to be important. If you want to get really good at something, it seems, you also need 12,500 hours of what I call deliberate rest and also about 30,000 hours of sleep. Rest is actually a skill that we can improve, that we can practice, that, and if we do so, that it will make us, it will help us do the kind of work that I think many of us, certainly many of your listeners, aspire to do and will you know, give us um, better lives in the short run and more fulfilling lives and careers in the long run. Why is it that the rest you take is every bit as critical to mastery as the hours of work you put in? This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. I'm here to help you cut out the noise to focus. By now, you've heard that you need 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become a master of your craft. The part of the story you don't hear is that it also takes 12,500 hours of deliberate rest. When you rest, you let what you've learned sink in. The ties connecting concepts get stronger and weak connections get cleared away. Alex Sujung Kim Pang is author of the book Rest, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less. He's also a visiting scholar at Stanford University and founder of The Restful Company, where he helps companies use deliberate rest to be more creative and productive. I picked up Rest to help with researching for my upcoming book, and you should pick it up too. It's at cadavy.net slash rest. It's fascinating. It's packed with research and stories about why rest is critical to creative productivity. And I had to have Alex on the show to learn more and have him break it down for us. So in this conversation, you're going to learn why should you be deliberate about using rest to make your work better? What's the hypnagogic state? And how did the surrealist painter Salvador Dali use it to get more creative ideas? Why did Ernest Hemingway always stop writing when he knew what was going to happen next? When's the best time to take a nap for optimal creative output? How long should that nap be? And if you're going to get any rest, you need to eliminate hassles from your everyday work. There are few bigger business-related hassles, I think, than dealing with postage, which is why I'm thrilled to have SendPro sponsoring the show today. SendPro eliminates hassles from buying postage for your business. And one of the really cool things about SendPro is that it's from Pitney Bowes. And Pitney Bowes was actually the first company to get permission to sell USPS postage way back in 1920. So they get a huge discount, and then they pass along that discount to you. And you can also compare and buy shipping from other carriers. So if you do any shipping, really, you should check out SendPro. It's only $5 a month, a third of the price of the competition. Time is money. So $5 a month is a bargain to never have to visit the post office again. Visit pb.com slash love your work and try it free for 90 days. That's pb as in peanut butter or pitney bows. pb.com slash love your work. And I was just looking at the uh, production schedule for love your work. And I realized that today is my 10th anniversary. July 18th, 2007 was my very first day of self-employment as an independent creator. And I remember I woke up on that morning and there was just vastness, just endless time and space that I could fill up with anything. And I had a hypothesis. I figured that if I followed my curiosity, if I followed my love, and if I mixed that up with enough persistence and enough self-discipline that I would eventually be able to fill that vastness with good things. That if I just started with like a little snowflake of curiosity, I could build it into a snowball and then I could roll it on the ground until it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, you know what? 10 years later, I'm actually honestly not positive that I was right. Yeah, I had a successful book and I travel the world and I can live wherever I want, but it hasn't really gelled yet. Like things have gotten more comfortable, but I still struggle a lot. Like, Yes, you just heard me read an ad from one of our great sponsors. And yes, there are new Love Your Work elite members trickling in. I'd like to thank Chris Deucing for joining, by the way. But I don't know. Like, Can you really follow what you love and work hard at it and make a sustainable living at it? I know some people can, but is it working for me? 
And meanwhile, I feel a lot of pressure to change my approach to make this all doable. Like I feel pressure to build a course on how to build courses. And I feel pressure to be bombastic. And I felt pressure to put this podcast on a network. But none of that is me. So I don't really know. But I feel like I'm close. Like I feel like I'm very close. So I'm sticking with it. And honestly, I still don't know if it's going to work. I certainly never imagined that it would take more than 10 years. So if you're behind me, if you want to help me crack the code on the intersection of love and work, then it would mean the world to me if you would join Love Your Work Elite. And it's not just a charity case. You're going to get exclusive access to office hours, hangouts with me, early access to episodes and ad-free interviews, and a lot more. Just go to lywelite.com. That's lywelite.com. Thanks so much. Here's Alex Pang. I'm here with Alex Pang. And Alex, I think that like a good entry point to our conversation today might be the so off-sighted 10,000 hour rule that if you have 10,000 hours of practice or deliberate practice, that you'll become this expert at something. Now, one might be tempted then to uh, just practice for 10,000 hours straight, take them roughly a year, <laughs> they, they would uh, become an expert. Um, besides the obvious issues of getting some sleep and stuff, let, let's extract like why that would be a wrong way to think about it. Sure. Um, the the 10,000 hours story, which is one that Malcolm Gladwell talks about in, I believe, The Tipping Point, um, comes from a study done by a sociologist named Anders Ericsson, who was looking at students at the Violin Conservatory in Berlin. And he was interested in what separated the really great students, the ones who were future uh, first orchestra first chairs and Deutsche Grammophon recording artists from the ones who were considered just good but not great. What he found or what he argued was that the difference between the good students and the great came down to how they practiced – and how much they practiced. So the the how much they practiced was the 10,000 hours that they that uh, that they put in more time in the practice room than the average student, but the how they practiced was also really important. Namely they engaged in what Erickson called deliberate practice where they were more thoughtful about what skills they were trying to refine at any given time. They were more solicitous of feedback. They were more thoughtful and mindful about how they practiced. Now, there were a couple uh, now there were a couple other things that Erickson also noted when he was looking at how these people spent their time. Um, one was that while they spent fewer hours per day doing leisure activities than the average students, they were much better at accounting for how they spent their time, how they spent their leisure. The other thing was that they slept more than the average students, generally about an hour per day more because they would take naps in the middle of the day. And so while this is a part of the story that isn't reported on very much – Right, the ten thousand hours is something that's it's a nice round number. It's very sexy. Gladwell thinks that he sees a similar kind of pattern with Bill Gates and Sun Microsystems co-founder Bill Joy and the Beatles and other people. Um, it's actually not just the ten thousand hours that turns out to be important. If you want to get really good at something, it seems you also need. 12,500 hours of what I call deliberate rest and also about 30,000 hours of sleep. And so you know, that's why it's impossible to become world-class in something in just a year of 10,000 hours of practice or two years because it seems that you actually need, first of all, a certain amount of time for the lessons of deliberate practice to kind of sink in, um, but also because – it's actually physically and mentally really challenging practice. 
Um, it is cognitively difficult. You've got to pay a, you've got to pay a lot of attention. It's physically difficult. And so about four hours of this stuff, often broken up into two two hour sessions with a break in between, is about the most that even you know, energetic and enthusiastic 18 and 19 year olds can handle in a day. So, you know, the for uh, you know, for better or worse, um, longer sessions of practice tend to provide less in the way of of focused attention and reward than the shorter, more intensive ones. So, for all of those reasons, if you believe the ten thousand hours are good, you have to schedule a few years for them rather than you know hope you can get it all done in just like one or two. Yeah, and you were saying like 12,500 hours of deliberate rest, 30,000 hours of sleep, and, and somewhere somewhere within there is you know, roughly 2,000 hours or so of, of naps, basically, right. like afternoon naps. Um, yeah. And if you I, I looked at this study, I, I uh, pulled it out and, and downloaded it, and um, you can look at the graphs of the usage of time, percentage of time used for different activities between these really top students and the ones who are merely good. And you see that just like you described it, there may be four hours of practice usually in the morning. And then there's this difference in the afternoon, right around 2 PM of the ones who are the top students are getting about an hour nap and the ones who are just merely good. Not, not so much. Right. You know, and in fact, there is uh, that since the Erickson study came out, there has been a bunch of really interesting work, mainly by a uh, sleep uh, sleep researcher named Sarah Mednick, who's now at uh, UC Riverside, about the restorative virtues of naps. And we've tended to think of naps as something that you know four year olds take on those little yoga mats in preschool, but yeah, you know, it turns out that lots of you know naps used to be a far more common thing for adults, right? Yeah, you know, in factories in the 19th century, there actually was time when the factory shut down in the middle of the day because it was assumed that everybody needed a rest. Um, you know, politicians from Winston Churchill to John F. Kennedy, you know, who was a model of youthful vigor, right? Um, would take naps in the middle of the day. And so this is, it is, uh, there is, there is a wisdom to that that I think we have lost sight of in, and we assume that if we just, you know, order up another latte or something that we can make up for the, t uh, make up for the fact that we've abandoned this practice. But, you know, in point of fact, the value of naps is not just that they improve our energy or but rather that they you know they they break up the day in ways that provide other kinds of psychological value and it seems that you know that they also um can sort of stimulate or or kind of nudge our creative abilities as well in ways that um, you know, caffeine or other stimulants might or might not. So, you know, for all of those reasons, um, you know, the, taking the, taking the time for an afternoon nap, if you can handle, you know, if you can fit it into your schedule, turns out to be time very well spent. And actually the, the researcher that you mentioned, Sarah, I believe she was the one who also had kind of identified, um, the positioning of a nap relative to the time that you woke up and how that affects um, the type of incubation that that happens when it comes to creative ideas and such. Is that something that you right. can expand on? Yeah, sure. So what Sarah found was that, uh, okay, so nap re uh, sleep researchers generally have known that there are a couple different things things in our circadian rhythms and our body clocks that determine how tired we are or how alert we are. And so sleep pressure is one thing that changes over the course of the day. And that essentially follows a kind of 24 hour rhythm. But wait, sleep, also, sleep pressure, so, can we define that? Sure. Uh, sleep pressure is simply the desire for sleep. Um, how much your, how much your body needs sleep. 
And then there is also a level of a kind of level of alertness that is part, that generally follows the day, um, but is also something that can be messed up when we do things like uh, you know sort of fly to Europe. So you know our, uh, so. You know, you get off the plane and by, you know, let's say 5 p.m. or so, if you're coming from California, you fe- you know, par- your body on one hand says, OK, it's about 2 or 3 a.m. I really should be asleep by now. On the other hand, or if your uh, your alertness system says it's only 5 p.m. The sun is still out. People are coming home from work. I shouldn't be going to sleep. And so. Jet lag is essentially what happens when those two systems come into conflict, when they send different kinds of signals. And your, you know, your body, in a sense, becomes confused about whether it ought to be awake or it ought to be asleep. So, but what Mednick found – so you know, these two cycles, in other words, don't progress in perfect lockstep, right? They are – they follow slightly different kinds of rhythms. And what Mednick found was that as a result of this, if you take a nap, let's say, a little bit earlier rather than a little bit later, um, you'll get slightly different kinds of benefits. So my, um, my memory is that a slightly earlier nap provides more of a creative boost, while a nap a little bit later in the afternoon will be more physically restorative. However, it should also be said that these are not, you know, gigantic order of magnitude differences, right? Mm-hmm. These are, you know, you're not going to be, you're not, you know, you're not going to be Einstein if you take a nap earlier and Usain Bolt if you take one, you know, later. Um, but rather, this is a way, r- the timing of the nap is one that um, you can nudge a little bit in order to get a, you know, a small boost in one direction or another. Now, having said that, I think that there, you know, the only bad nap is the one that you need but you don't take. You know, whether it is at eleven forty-five or at one forty-five. So, you know, I think that the, you know, for most of us, and actually after reading Mednick's work, I became a real convert to uh, convinced about the value of naps, and I'm now completely unapologetic about taking them. I think that the, you know, that. Um, yeah, to the degree that we can adjust when those happen to get some sort of uh, some sort of extra benefit is good. However, I think that naps themselves provide enough benefit, no matter what, no matter when in the day they happen. So that you know they're uh, they're worth they're they're worth taking whenever you need them. We had a, a neuroscientist on in the show earlier, John Cunios, who studies the neuroscience of insight. And uh-huh. um, definitely from that conversation, I, I gleaned that uh, sleep is one of those things, when, especially when it comes to creative work, that it really uh, helps with what they call incubation. Um, mm-hmm. you know, so for example, or, or actually the consolidation of, of memories being one of those things. So that if, if I tell you that, uh, Tom is taller than Jack and Jack is taller than Harry and you, you take a, a nap, you're, you're going to be quicker to understand that, that Tom is taller than Harry. Uh, right. these things that are just sort of, uh, uh, implied by by the information. So, uh, are there any other things when it comes to creative work specifically? Are there any other, other things related to sleep and and napping um, that are interesting that support, uh, from a research standpoint, the, this idea that we should be taking more naps. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there are a couple things, and one of them is that um, you know there are a small but notable community of people who learn how to use naps, who learn how to almost incorporate naps into their creative lives or their creative processes. These are people who don't necessarily go all the way asleep, you know, sort of, uh, but rather um, kind of drift along the edge or the boundary between um, awareness and unconsciousness. Uh, I forget what the name of this is. It's, uh, this is, uh, this is, this is, 
so that's the hypnagogic state. Hypnog- that's it, yes. So, and then there is um, in the if and in the extremely early morning, if you wake up before your alarm goes off and you're kind of drifting in and out of out of consciousness, that's a hypnopompic state. So, but oh. um, one of the interesting things about those states is that, in a sense, the door between your conscious mind and the subconscious is still a little bit ajar in a way that it is not when you are fully awake. And so people like, I think most notably, the artist Salvador Dali made use of this. And Dali actually in his book, 50 Secrets of Magic Craftsmanship, talks about a method for using maps to kind of recover or excavate imagery from the subconscious that otherwise is inaccessible. This is a book, as you can imagine, uh, from uh, given its source, was full of all kinds of totally, totally crazy stuff. And however, the section on maps is incredibly specific and detailed. And we have accounts from other people who were uh, who were friends of his that indicate that he actually did do this. And Dali's argument was that you, you spend time thinking about a painting before you ever start on it, and that your subconscious actually does an awful lot of the work of composing the painting, even before you and your conscious mind um, you know, uh, uh, put put brush to canvas. So in a sense, what he's arguing is that there is this incubation stage that happens without your conscious awareness and that the objective of the artist is to, or, uh, is to access, access those ideas that your subconscious has already, uh, has already created, but which are not accessible to your conscious mind. And so what he recommended was this method of napping where you sit in a chair after lunch, often after a couple glasses of wine, um, and you hold in your hand something heavy, like a set of keys, for example. And you begin to drift off. You're thinking about the painting a little bit. You don't try too hard. And as you start to fall asleep, you're... Uh, your subconscious will take up the subject of the painting and will you know, will suggest, what about doing this? You know, have uh, have this image, or kind of recover recover some idea that uh, that is stored in your mind, but which you uh, but which you can't um, which you can't access if you're fully awake. The image comes to mo- uh, comes to mind as you're drifting off to sleep. As that happens, your hand relaxes because your body relaxes as you start to fall asleep. The keys fall to the ground and you and this jolts you awake just enough so that you can you know sketch out whatever this idea was and then you get the keys and you can go and you can repeat the process. And he argued that this was with practice an effective way of probing the the kind of catalog of ideas for a painting that the subconscious had already produced and that uh, and that and that he the conscious artist could now recover um was this as you know rest- uh, you know was this as physically restorative as you know a nap where you're lying to, the, the sort of nap that say Winston Churchill took again after lunch, again, after several glasses of wine where he would, um, you know, change into pajamas and actually get into bed and go to sleep for a couple hours? Probably not. On the other hand, you know, arguably, um, Dali's, you know, Dali's method worked pretty well for him, you know, worked for him and the results speak for themselves. For his purposes, yeah. If you're a, exactly. a surrealist painter versus you are commanding a war, Right. Um, there's different needs involved there. Um, Definitely. Yeah, I love the story of of Dolly. And there's another story which actually is more difficult to confirm because he he didn't write about it, uh, of uh, Thomas Edison with, with ball mm-hmm. bearings in his hands 
Uh, I still don't, still don't know whether that actually whether he whether he actually did that, but it's the similar idea. Yeah, I've I have never been able to track that down myself. Um, you know, there is a, but um, there are at least oblique accounts of Edison and a few other people doing this. But so it seems, and Dali himself talks about learning this method from, um, I want to say Trappist monks, but they may have been some other, some other order. Whether that, that to me seems like the most um, fabulous part of the story, but it's entirely possible that Dali himself learned it from someone else, given that there are accounts of other people doing very similar kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it is a practice that remains pretty rare, um, maybe in part because you know, the kind of you know, as we all know, the imagery that we have when we're falling asleep or the imagery that we have in our dreams is often stuff that's pretty wild. And so there are not that many of us who could make use of stuff that is that unusual. Um, Dali was exceptional for being someone for whom dreamlike imagery was actually a really valuable thing and was you know, surprisingly difficult to generate when he was fully conscious. So, you know, for him, this is a, this is, this made naps valuable as a kind of creative tool that, you know, you might, that might not be quite as useful in the same way to someone like, you know, a neurosurgeon or, you know, or, you know, or a writer um, or people who are dealing with far less surreal kinds of things. Yeah, he Still. was going for something very, very specific. But going back to the 10,000 right. hour study, uh, I remember yeah. one thing that I thought that was very interesting about that was that they found that the students who were napping, they weren't napping on the weekends, um, which indicated that perhaps the napping was a result of having to recover from that extra deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we systematically sort of underestimate in our modern knowledge economy lives is just how physically taxing and demanding cognitive work is. You know, I mean, because, you know, when you, you compare it to like farmers or people who are digging ditches, sitting in a chair, looking at a screen or looking at paper doesn't look like work at all, right? In fact, there are plenty of us who, you know, get into these industries in part because we think it's not, you know, sort of hard work. Um, certainly not in the way that manual work is. And but you know, it turns out that the kind, you know, that the kind of intense, focused cognitive effort that goes into things like deliberate practice or that you see people in my book um, organizing their days around. It's actually physically really, really exhausting. And so I think it's no surprise that you know, naps, are, uh, naps are something that um, – uh, the, the the Berlin Conservatory students are doing on the weekdays rather than the weekends. That also helps explain why naps are so common among very creative people in the cohort who are uh, who are who are organizing their days around periods of really deeply intensively focused work and then equally long periods of deliberate rest. Um, no, I think, and so I think the uh, that you know, this or the need for naps is something that comes not from you know age or infirmitude, but rather the fact that 
cognitive work is actually hard. Mm -hmm. And just to, just to, I guess, unpack or get more specific about what deliberate practice might might look like, like for myself mm -hmm. as a podcaster or a writer, there's so many things that I can do that are kind of practicing, right? I might read a book that I find kind of pleasurable. I might brainstorm some things that I'm working on, but if I'm being, or I might listen to my podcast over and over again to try to look for ways that I can ask better questions or something like that. But if I'm being deliberate, right. then I'm maybe trying to write something that's shippable, like a shippable blog post and, and, and getting, getting it out there. Or if I'm listening to a podcast and writing down the things that were said and writing down the areas where I maybe could have said something different or where there might've been another question and being more deliberate there, that mm -hmm. might help distinguish kind of what deliberate practice is versus some of the more casual practice. Is that right. accurate? Yes, it is. It um, Anders Ericsson talks about deliberate practice as being focused and structured and offering clear goals and feedback. Um, for conservatory students, I think that the you know, the the structure and clear goals and feedback are you know, are much easier to achieve than they are in some other walks of life because you're learning how to play the violin in you know, or, uh, as a classically trained musician. So the goals there are really, really clear. Um, in a lot of life, the goals are a little fuzzier. The feedback isn't quite as tight, but still, you know, you can apply many of the same kinds of principles to, you know, the, and, uh, uh, to, let's say, um, you know, listening to your own performance or editing a piece of work, um, or doing any number of other kinds of things. And so I think that the, that, you know, uh, that there is, and I see a parallel between the kind of intensive work that a lot of, or of very successful creative people do and deliberate practice in the sense that it is, you know, it's more focused, it's uh, sort of more mindful, often because it happens as part of much bigger and often well-organized creative projects. Um, there is a certain amount of planning and structure that's kind of built around it. You know, when, when Ernest Hemingway, for example, gets up at 6 a.m. or Anthony Trollope at 5 to continue work on their latest novels, they wake up knowing exactly where they are in, uh, in, uh, or in their manuscripts and what they, have to, what they have to write next, often because they've set things up the day before in order to make the next day's work go a little bit more easily. And so on that, and so there is this planned, structured aspect to their work, just as there is to deliberate practice. So I think, you know, that you know, indeed, that that kind of way of working is one that is increasingly important for us to learn or of how to master, you know, or of uh, that, you know, in a world that values creativity and innovation more than it value, uh, often more than it values the ability to do the same thing over and over again with a reasonably high degree of skill. That, that you know, that kind of you know that kind of deliberate practice, that kind of focused work, becomes something that you know is actually. You know, it's actually more and more important for us to, you know, sort of to learn how to do. And it turns out also more important for us to learn how to recover from. So, I mean, in the case of, of Anthony Trollope and uh, Ernest Hemingway, I know Hemingway would very often refer to his juice, you know, like his ability to to write was his juice. And you've got to stop while you still have some juice. You got to stop while you still know what's going to happen. And then you have mm -hmm. to get your writing out of your mind and, and not think about it until the next day. And it's, it's the waiting. That's the hard part and, and, and such. And then Anthony Trollope, it you know, worked at the post office for 33 years and, you know, published 47 novels and a number of other works and would get up and have his three hours with his timer in front of him, 250 words every 15 minutes was his quota. And if he finished a, a novel during that time, he'd put in another piece of paper and start the next novel. But when that, when that clock was over, he was done. And, and that it seems to be supported by some research that I remember from the book of, of about, um, the incubation of an idea when you know that you're going to attack it again later. 
Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so there's uh, there was some work done by neuroscientists at the University of Sydney, where they were measuring, comparing performance on creativity tests between two groups of people. Um, one group would do this creativity test, something called, a, I believe, it was a remote associates test, where uh, where you were Did there were, no, sorry. were triads by chance no, or no sorry no actually it was a it was a it was a different kind of test where you're doing things um you're finding novel uses for an ordinary object so you know a pencil or a brick and so you want to come up with as as many unusual uses as you can in let's say a 2 minute period so you had two groups of people doing this you had and you had one group who would do it and then work on math problems for a couple minutes. And then – and at the start of the experiment, they were told, okay, we're going to do – after the math problems, you're going to go back to the unusual uses test and do a second round. There was a second group of people who followed the same pattern or – you know, a couple minutes of or of unusual uses, a couple minutes of math problems, a couple more minutes of unusual uses, but they were not told – that they uh, that they were going to go back and do the creativity test a second time. What the researchers found was that not only did the people in the first group, the ones who knew they were going back to the problem, score better the second time than the people who didn't, they often outperformed themselves the second time. And the math problems were designed to be difficult enough so that you actually really had to think about them, right? You couldn't just kind of do them mechanically and cheat and continue thinking about uses for the brick. What this suggests is that what they concluded was that the difference in performance um, could be explained by – you know, the subjects subcon uh, subconsciously continuing to work on these problems, even while uh, the students were sort of you know were were thinking about something else. And what this provides is a kind of experiment. And you know, we have to, I think, include the caveat that there is there is arguably a big difference between coming up with novel uses for a pencil. And the kind of you know big C creative work that goes into composing a symphony or you know, developing a scientific theory. Yeah, you know, there's there's always this question of how much you can translate these laboratory findings into regular life. Having said that, I think it is it is very suggestive that you see uh, you know, that this awareness that you're going to go back to a problem. Um, boosts performance in these laboratory tests and that you have people like Ernest Hemingway, um, you know, stopping work for the day with the idea that doing so will not only make it a little bit easier to start the next day, but it will also kind of nudge their subconscious minds to keep working on the plot, to think through the next, you know, sort of, sort of the, you know, the next day's events, the next, you know, the next chapter of dialogue. Um, John Cleese talked about this as well. The you know the the, the co-founder of Monty Python. Um, he talked. He had a couple experiences where, when he was writing for uh, the Cambridge Footlights, he would sometimes get stuck on a joke, and he'd go to sleep, and the next morning he'd start working on it again. And on the a, punchline on a blank would, sheet of paper, right? Yeah, on, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, the punchline would come to him really quickly. And he said, you know, half the time he couldn't even see why he had had a problem the night before. And so, you know, this suggests that overnight his, you know, his subconscious keeps working on it. The well, second additionally, he would, he would pick up the, the, the script that he was working on the night before and compare it with the one that he had just written from scratch and see that like, Oh, you know, he, he remembered parts of it, but like the new one's better. Like it, it's right, yeah. the, the connections have been tighter. made. Right. Yeah. It was punchier. And, you know, this was, and you know, what he, what he took away from this was that number was that, you know, number one, his subconscious could do plenty, you know, could do plenty of work if he himself, you know, or have started the process. You couldn't just, you know, go out and, you know, spend the night at the pub and then get up the next day and assume that your subconscious will have written it all for you, right? You've got to do the work yourself. 
and then you kind of hand the problem off to your or your creative unconscious who will then take it up and continue working on it but i think that you know one of the one of the amazing things is that that ability to pass ideas between your sort of conscious mind and your sort of subconscious is actually a skill that you can refine and improve and second that you know, part of the story of del- of uh, of rest and the story of you know uh, this idea of deliberate rest is that it's a it's a strategy for giving yourself both the time in the day and the mental space to have that process happen and i think that this you know this explains why you know why it was why for super ambitious people who were often in these incredibly competitive fields who felt great pressure to achieve that you know that's why they found it useful to do things like you know go in the middle of the day on long walks and then take a nap when you know many of their you know, many of their competitors would have been hunkered down in the laboratory or you know at their desks because they realized that they were able to have insights in days like that. They were able to push ideas further than they were when they simply, you know, did nothing but try to focus all day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that helps explain why they both had lives that seemed more pleasant and more leisurely than ours often were and they also got so much more done than you know or than um you know than many of us do one interesting thing about that uh 10,000 hour study I'll just keep calling it that sure. is uh <laughs> Is that when you looked at the graphs uh, between the the students who were excellent, were you know the best, and the mm-hmm. ones who were merely good, um, it was the ones who were the best. It was a sharper graph. They they seemed seemed like across the group they were more disciplined in what time they went to bed, what time they woke up, what time they right. took their nap, and then it also turned out that later on when when they asked them to, uh, I think it was. Uh, report how they thought they used different, you know, how much leisure time they had during the week that, that they were more accurate in, in saying the exact number of hours that they had. They were more structured with their time, even choosing their leisure time. Right. Absolutely. You know, and I think this, this points to two things. I mean, one is that, um, even while they spent less time at leisure, they were more thoughtful about how they spent it and what they did. The second, I think, is that we often have this romantic idea of creativity as being uh, of unpredictable and chaotic and proceeding through sudden insights in the middle of the night. And in fact, you know, while and while there is this dimension of creative thinking, this or of dimension of innovation that is that has an unexpectedness about it it turns out that actually routine routines like those seen in the 10,000 hour study actually support the development of creative uh, of the skills necessary to be creative and creative think and also support creative thinking itself much more than than i think we normally recognize that uh, in Stephen King talk uh, has this line about how you know he works at the same time every day you know and this is a guy who writes I mean he makes Anthony Trollope look like a slacker right um, you know and essentially his argument is that number one that you know the the relationship between between writing and inspiration that a lot of people sort of uh, have is backwards. It's not that you get inspired and you start writing. It's that you start writing and then you get inspired, because the muse needs to know where you are if it's going to work its magic. Um, and they and in a sense, 
the muse needs to see that you're putting in the work before it's going to condescend to, you know, sort of show up and help you out. And so I think that the, uh, you know, and the, and I think that the lives of the Berlin students offer an illustration of the fact that these kinds of routines, you know, this kind of organization doesn't make you less creative. In f- it, kind of creates a foundation for you to be, you know, to be your most creative self. Yeah. I, I don't know if you've ever read the book Daily Rituals, but it, it has uh, just tons and tons of different creators that it's amazing how structured most of their schedules are. Now, the ones who don't have structured schedules turn, tend to be alcoholics or they're hooked on drugs or something and sure they accomplish great things, but they're sort of more the exception than they, than they are the rule, it seems. Right. No, the fact that that Mason Curry could write a book called Daily Rituals tells you something about, you know, sort of about the prevalence of these, well, daily rituals in the lives of, of really creative people. Um, and, you know, I think you're right that the, you know, the, the, the people who are the biggest exceptions are often the people who do things like, you know, die young or – you know, are, you know, they're, 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 they're staying up, not because of inspiration, but, you know, because of the combination of absinthe and, you know, hashish and what, you know, and sort of other things that are interrupting their sleep patterns. Right. And so I've been looking at this stuff for the last few years and, and I know I was somebody who really was skeptical of routines, was skeptical of having some sort of a quota for what I would do. But then I, I went ahead mm-hmm. and tried it. So like 2016, I decided, all right, every morning I'm going to go ahead and, and write. Uh, at this time, I'm going to publish a 500 word blog post every morning at this time, you know, and, uh, and, you know, at first I was very resistant to doing that, but it turned out that over the course of 2016, I ended up having four times the word output that I did in 2015. Now that sounds like, you know, the old me would have said, well, yeah, was it good? Um, but I, my work started, my writing started getting noticed, getting noticed. I started getting picked up by, by better publications and stuff like it really worked. And one of the things that I found was that having that structure and have, and deciding ahead of time that this is what I'm going to do every day at these times, even though I would get up in the morning and a lot of times I wouldn't want to start writing once I got mm-hmm. 10 minutes in, it was, it was, it was all fine. And it really helped break through that resistance that, you know, Stephen Pressfield so astutely identified in, in the war of art and, um, having that structure really, really does work. Um, now we were talking a little bit, a lot about sleeping earlier, and then we've, we've touched a little bit on leisure. Um, and so I think it's important to point out that, you know, rest isn't just sleeping or napping, you know, there's other types right. of rest, right? Right. Yeah, and you know, I think that uh, there is one of the other big things that I talk about in the book is what I call deep play, which are hobbies or other kinds of forms of serious leisure that are time-consuming. They're often expensive. They can be even physically dangerous in the case of things like mountain climbing, but which, but which, creative people will often engage in and be very serious about um, and which I think help sort of sustain and extend their creative lives. So, you know, one example is is a biophysicist named Britton Chance who um, actually, who was a serious sailor. He started in his teens. His father was a wealthy Philadelphia industrialist. And so, you know, when they made a bunch of money, one of the first things he did, he, he does, after getting the big house is buy a big yacht. Um, Hemingway actually spent some time on the yacht in the Caribbean um, with them. They, they went, um, they went fishing together, but you know, chance is chance gets a, gets a PhD and is, and his career is immediately derailed by world war II. He spends the war doing uh, weapons research, radar research rather than, you know, rather than pure science. And so, at the end of at the end of the war, he goes back to being a researcher, and he's very aware of the fact that other people have, you know, spent five years doing science, and he's lost his time, so he's trying really hard to catch up. But he's also a very serious sailor, so serious, in fact, that he takes 
a good six months in 1952 to um, to sail. He goes to the 52 Olympics in Helsinki and wins a gold medal in the 5.5 meter yacht category. Now, chances are, and so he's a really nice example of someone who even, you know, even despite his ambition and the competitiveness of his field is still willing to invest a lot of time in what looks like um, a, you know, a, a frivolous activity. But he talked about racing as, and sailing as being a lot like science without the discouraging parts of it. So, you know, when you're in a race, there are a whole bunch of discrete problems that you've got to solve. Um, you know, you have to figure out where the wind is coming from. You have to figure out how, you know, sort of uh, how how to sail around, you know, various goals in a way that you know sort of gets you to the finish line before the before the other team. He also liked to sail a particular class of yacht where you had a lot of variability. You know, you could you could make all kinds of changes to the rigging and to the sails and the weight distribution. And so there was a lot of literally a lot of experimentation that you could do. On the other hand, you know, at the end of the day, you knew if you'd won or lost. In contrast to science, where often you know you could spend weeks on an experiment, and the results the results would tell you uh, maybe you're right, maybe you're not. You know, there is uh, there was always this uncertainty to the scientific process that was you know that uh, that could make it frustrating. And so, for Chance, you know, he felt like sailing wasn't something that uh, you know that uh, that took away from his life as a scientist but rather it kind of refined his appetite for competition it sharpened his intuition it gave and it reminded him even when his career was at its lowest of the things that he loved most about science and one of the things you see in people who are you know creative well into their 70s or their 80s or even beyond, is that they all have these kinds of hobbies. They have this kind of deep play that helps often, you know, uh, helps sustain them psychologically. Um, it's often something that keeps them in, you know, in better physical shape than, you know, than they than they would be if most of their leisure consisted of, you know, or of dealing with joysticks or TV remotes. Um, but it's also something that is serious enough to take them outside of their normal work and to give them, you know, to give them a break from um, often difficult jobs, even, uh, you know, even as it also reminds them of what they love best of, uh, in the world about their work. The other thing, too, is that for people who is that this kind of serious leisure is really important for people who don't have a lot of control over their daily schedules. You know, people like Beethoven or Darwin or, you know, these are you know, uh, these are people who could live however they wanted, you know, and so for them. You know, this model of four intensive hours and a long leisurely walk and a nap was something that they could, you know, they could do. But if you are, let's say, Winston Churchill or you know, a neurosurgeon or, or, you know, or a doctor, you don't have that kind of control over your daily schedule. Um, and so for them, this kind of deep play is really important because it establishes a kind of boundary between your professional and working life and your personal life that otherwise might not exist. You know, I think that the, both the, the, the blessing and the curse of um, high-intensity professions and of creative work is that it is super absorbing. And when it goes well, it's great because it's super absorbing. When it goes poorly, it's terrible because it is super absorbing. And so... For you know, for your own mental health and for your own, you know, for your own kind of professional and creative longevity, it turns out to be really great to have this other thing in your life that is rewarding and you know in similar kinds of ways, but which is also very very different. Whether it's different physically, whether it involves working in a different, you know, in a different medium or at a different scale, and which you know helps you be a you know a 
somewhat better, healthier version of yourself than you would be if all you did was, you know, or if nothing but work. Yeah. So deep play, if you're in a profession that you don't have a lot of control of your time, it can provide you with control. On the flip side, if you're in a profession like mine, where I have total control of my time, I know that I, I, I used to, when I lived closer to the water, I, I, uh, took up sailing. And that was mm -hmm. uh, really an interesting thing because there were these restrictions. You had to plan a lot, a lot more. Right. You had to be a lot more deliberate about what you were going to do. But then there's also this, this, this sort of skills transfer. And it seems like there's, there's always going to be something in whatever leisure activity you choose that translates to whatever other thing, whatever your profession is, and that you can sort of hone hone those skills in a context that isn't attached to your own profession, and that that can help you uh, relax and at the same time incubate ideas. Absolutely, no, I think that the you know, the that you know, without a doubt there are people who. Um, never quite find what that, you know, the, the sort of what that deep play is for them, um, you know, or who are kind of interested in a whole bunch of a whole bunch of different things. But I think that the you know, the uh, people who are most fortunate are the ones who discover this other thing that is psychologically restorative and takes them, you know, takes them out of their work and out of their normal lives for a while, but lets them go back, you know, go back to work feeling like, you know, they're ready to return. Like they've, you know, they've, uh, they've recovered the inner, you know, the mental and physical energy that you naturally have to expend in great quantities when you're doing really serious work. Alex, this has been awesome. We, we've talked about some parts of the book, but there's so much more in, in rest, why you get more done when you work less. I really recommend everybody uh, check it out. And do you have a final message for everybody else, out, everybody out there who's trying to find satisfaction in their work about how they can use rest that would wrap up our conversation today? You know, I think that the one thing I would tell people is to take rest seriously, that we often think of rest as a competitor to work, as almost a sign of weakness and or as something that you know you get when you have time when you're finished with everything else the thing is in today's world you're never finished with everything right there's always more to be done there's always more you know you could always add a little bit more to to what you're doing improve the quality a bit and so i think it is essential that we be mindful and we be protective and sometimes even a little bit ruthless about taking rest seriously, about taking it back from a world that or wants to wants to deny its importance and steal it from us, and to recognize that rest is actually a skill that we can improve, that we can practice, that and if we do so, that it will make us – it will help us do the kind of work that I think many of us, certainly many of your listeners, aspire to do and will you know, give us um, better lives in the short run and more fulfilling lives and careers in the long run. And where can people get more of you? So um, the there is a uh, I blog about deliberate rest and uh, at uh, deliberate dot rest rest turns out rest actually became a top level domain last year so <laughs> you know as soon as, as soon as that happened I, I I went out and and grabbed that URL so deliberate dot rest is where I talk about. Um, uh, new hist you know, new research in about uh, sleep or the neuroscience of creativity. I also talk some about companies and organizations that are impl that are finding their own ways to get more done while working less, or to bring rest into uh, rest as a benefit and a creative stimulus into their work and into the lives of their employees. Great. Well, I appreciate so much you taking the time today to talk with us. And uh, now it's time to get some rest, I guess. Thanks. You bet. All right. I 
hope you'll take on Alex Pang's challenge to take rest and leisure more seriously. And I know since reading his book, I've actually been taking a nap every afternoon. Again, you can get Alex's book, Rest, While You Get More Done When You Work Less, at cadavy.net slash rest. And to learn more about how rest contributes to creativity, listen to episode eight with John Cunos. John is a neuroscientist studying how creative insights and aha moments happen in your brain. Sleep is not doing nothing. Sleep is mental work. Sleep is creative work. Your brain is churning over memories. It's clearing out the mental cobwebs. It's generating ideas. Sleep is itself work. So if a person is trying to solve a problem and they take a nap to sleep on it, that's not not working on the problem. That is working on the problem. Again, John is on episode eight. Or listen to behavioral scientist Dan Ariely on episode 51. Dan is always experimenting with new ways to improve his own life, so he shares some sleep tips with us. One thing that I do at night, uh, which actually the research support, is I don't do anything in bed but read. Uh, Sorry, but sleep. So I don't do anything in bed but sleep. If I want to do something else, I do it out of bed. Mm -hmm. So... I I usually try to read before falling asleep, and I read on a chair rather than in, in bed. And I'm trying to basically, not trying, I'm conditioning my body to know that when I'm in bed, I'm serious. It, this, is, this means sleep time. It's not, it's not something else. Again, Dan is on episode 51. And if you appreciate all the work that goes into making this show, there are a couple of ways you can help support it. One is to subscribe, 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 whether it is on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts, just hit the subscribe button. Another is to rate the show. On Overcast, it's really easy. Just tap the star icon on this episode. On Apple Podcasts, just go to cadavy.net slash Apple, click on write a review and click on the star rating. You don't even have to write a review. It really just takes a couple of seconds. You can also join Love Your Work Elite. You'll get access to episodes before everyone else. You can even get ad-free interviews weeks in advance, and you can get your name or business mentioned in the credits of the show. For details, go to cadavy.net slash elite. That's cadavy.net slash elite. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by top Love Your Work elite members, such as Arif Akhtar. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is More Streets, performed by Spiderflower. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc.